Our scripture reading this morning is fairly short, but we're continuing with our study on Elijah and Elisha. We're in the story about Elisha these weeks, and sometimes it's easier to I preach whenever something there's continuity and I, um, or a, on a series. And I, so I, our subject today is Proving God in Difficult Times. And the verses are quite short, but I, I'm sure for many of you they're familiar. 2 Kings and chapter 4, and we'll read from verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what is thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbours. Empty vessels, borrow not a few. Or in brackets in my Bible it says, Or scant not. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stead. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. And again in the bracket, whenever it comes to pay thy debt, in the bracket in my Bible it says, Pay the creditor. And may God bless his word to our hearts this morning. There's a program that I listen to, well, not very often, but now and again, it's called Moneybox. And it's Paul Lewis on Radio 4, and he covers different subjects. And a couple of weeks ago, I thought it was rather interesting because it was covering the aspect of debt. And the question was asked, if a husband dies, is the wife responsible for her debt? And if the wife dies, is the husband responsible for her death? And so I listened to it, not that I don't think my wife's in too much debt, I I don't think so, but I listened very attentively anyway to see what the answer was. Am I responsible for my wife's death if something happens to her and she leaves me huge debts or vice versa? The answer is yes and the answer is also No. And you may think, well, that's a strange kind of an answer. But I remember years ago doing just basic GCSE law, and it was only back then that I heard the term about joint tenants and tenants in common. And so if my wife and I were to own a property, and we own that property as joint tenants, and I leave, I sum that, that debt cannot come against my property if I'm a joint tenant. It's only about 20 years ago that I heard the other term where people own property and they own it as tenants in common. And if you own your house as tenants in common, you own half the house, your husband or whoever owns the other half. And so whenever it comes to the end of life, you decide where you want your half to go and your spouse decides where they want their half to go. And so I listened, I I was quite interesting about it, about the subject of debt. Now, as I come and as I prepared this a week ago, this story here, it follows on from the story of Elisha, where you remember that Elisha has been performing miracles and there's different things that's been happening. But then there's this certain woman, she comes and she cries, I to the prophet of God. 
This is a story about a cry for help from one of the wives of the prophets. These prophets were spiritual fathers. Uh, the prophet Elisha and also the prophet Elijah. There were junior prophets and there were also future prophets. They were what we would call today Bible college students who are preparing for ministry. And some of the sons of the prophets, we know that in the Old Testament, priests and Levites, they were allowed to marry. And so this one was married. This is a story about debt. And I, as I say, it's something that no doubt will apply to all of us, maybe at some stage of our lives. There's an old German proverb, and it goes like this here, He who borrows sells his freedom. It was Solomon in all his wisdom that reminds us that the borrower is the servant of the lender. And so we have all that already in the scriptures. Now, I read a story about a, a woman, and I, she was having problems paying back her loan. And so the newspaper carried the story of this woman, and she went to the bank manager, and she says to the bank manager, she explains she's having trouble with her easy payment plan. Could he offer her an easier one? <laughs> now, that could be rather uh, complicated, maybe. But I want to say this here, that that is nothing new. It's something that has always been around. Uh, and the only way that people uh, so often survive in a debt situation is where you're advised that if you're in debt, to speak to your financial provider as soon as you realize that there's a problem. Now, I know today that there's all different things that are available for those that are in debt. There's debt clinics, there's debt counseling, there's debt plans, there's many, many different areas of life that a, a people can go down. And so remember that debt is not something new. Sometimes you will hear people quote, I owe no man anything. And I heard a preacher saying one day that uh, he didn't have a, a house or a mortgage for the simple reason he was expecting the Lord to come back and would the Lord take him off and leave him with a heap of debt. Now, that maybe opens up a little bit of a debate or that. We could say, well, whoever wants, whoever's left behind can sort it out afterwards or that. But I don't think the Bible is dealing with that. There is such a thing as debt and there's debt. There's debt that is manageable and there's other debt that, of course, it is not. Whenever this Bible speaks of owing no man anything, it's not speaking primarily about financial debt. We could owe someone love. We could owe someone an apology. We could owe someone time. We could owe someone sympathy. There's many things that we could owe one another. But we're told in this passage, there's debt in the family. And since her husband is dead, she cannot pay the bills. And that's really the bottom line, as verse 1 tells us. She comes to Elisha, she says, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And so, uh, debt is nothing new. And so, there's debt in the family. Now, the rabbis teach that this woman... I'm not saying this is true or not, but I understand that the rabbis teach that this woman was married to Obadiah. And Obadiah was the man that hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in the cave, and he fed them on bread and water. But we know that in life, the two great burdens to be left with anyone is death and also death. And so this woman did exactly what modern-day counselors would advise, I, people to do, and that is get advice. Now, some people may be too proud to get advice whenever there's that. Some may think, and they may feel ashamed. We ought not to. Some may maybe just say, well, I'm too afraid of that. And I certainly have met those over the years, and they've told me, I wouldn't even open a bank statement or a visa statement. I'm too afraid. 
I was in a course some years ago with a young man, and uh, he shared with the, the, the class, he said that he was uh, offered one day a visa. And he applied for the visa, and he said immediately, they give him £2,000 of a credit limit. And so he said what I did was, I went out and I bought myself some nice clothes, I booked myself a holiday, but he never thought of the paying back time. And then he said, because he shared it with the group, he said, I'll tell you what I did was, I took myself over to England and I thought, sure, it'll be forgot about now. But he discovered that the debt still followed him. Now, I, um, I would say, dear friends, that uh, the two great burdens, as I've mentioned, is debt. There's also, we're told, this woman had to cope with death in the family. Her husband is dead. Her lover, her friend, her provider, her protector uh, has been taken from her. Now, maybe there's some of you and you've experienced that before. Maybe you have. And so we're told about the woman's despair. She comes and she cries to Elisha. That word cried is an interesting word. It means to moan, to weep uncontrollably. It means the depths of grief. The word identifies the sound of a heart that is broken. And so she comes to the man of God whenever she's at the lowest moment in her life. And I would say to you, dear friend, that every one of us, there's no one exempt, there will be times in life whenever you will hit a low moment. Maybe it'll be some day, God forbid, that your doorbell will ring and the policeman will stand at the door and tell you that there's a tragedy. Maybe it'll be some day whenever maybe that uh, your spouse walks out on you. Maybe it'll be some day whenever you lose your job. But some day whenever you will hit a low. So never be too proud. Never think that you're above all that, because certainly none of us are. And so this woman, she's in a desperate state. And maybe there's some, and you've been there today. Maybe it's nothing to do with that. It's some other issue in your life. And you've been there. Now, they must have gone through some hard times and had to borrow a large amount of money. Now, the husband is dead. Now, if it was today, there would probably, probably be life cover in the husband. There would probably be financial security. You know, it was uh, John Wesley's father, who was an Anglican clergyman, and he struggled with debt all his life. All his life. John Wesley tried to avoid it. Maybe that's why, he, whenever he died, he had only a few items left. He had a watch and a few bits and pieces. Because he tried to avoid that. This widow here has nothing to sell. Now if this widow was married on a farmer today, maybe there'd be a farm of land to sell. Maybe there'd be a big house or a big estate. Maybe there'd be something that would make life more comfortable. And so the widow would be able to say, well look here, my husband's dead. There's a lot of debt here now. We'll sell our inheritance and we'll have a good time on it. But she has no inheritance to sell. So she can't do that. And so... Uh, the widow has nothing to sell. Remember, she's living in a day whenever there's no DHSS, there's no pension credit, there's no housing benefit, there's no tax credits, there's no attendance allowance, there's no disability living allowance or personal independence payments or whatever. We could go on and on and on. But there's none of that. And so there's a huge debt. But there's no money. And there's no assets to sell to meet the needs of that debt. She simply has a debt and she has nothing to pay. You see, sometimes there's nothing like a problem to drive us to God. She had no inheritance, remember? Elisha couldn't pay for it because prophets were not rich people, they were God's spokespeople. Her life had been a life of devotion to the Lord, and in her trouble she still trusts him and turns to him for the things she needs. Her husband, she says, thy servant, did fear the Lord. He certainly would have been a God-fearing man. But despite her pain and her problems and her lack of possibilities, she still looked up to God for the help she needed. Now, you may be in the Lord's house today, and you may have no problem with finance, none whatsoever. But there could be umpteen other problems in your life. Umpteen others. I want to say that at the low end, 
this woman went to the, the right source. Even humanly speaking, there was no way out. She knew she couldn't see everything, that God was still in control. She knew God, she knew God cared, and so she cried to him by faith. It's a wonderful thing to know today that God cares. I don't know, if you profess God's child and you think God doesn't care for you, well, all I can say is, dear help you, what kind of a heavenly father do you worship today? Because he does care. Do you not believe his word whenever he says, do you think he's a liar? And I said, I have all due respects. Whenever Peter says he cares for you, do you say, no, God doesn't care for me? Well, all I can say is, dear help you. If that is your attitude, because he does care today. He's the one that cares. He knows all about our struggles. Now there's some lessons in this verse, uh, these verses that we need to note here today. And that is that every one of us at some time, and I've already covered this, will arrive at a low point in our lives. There will come a day whenever you will reach the end of your rope. I read about that 11 year old lying drunk in her own vomit. I said to myself, well, God help that family. It's not an easy, an easy day to bring up children. It's not. It's rather difficult. Maybe someday your wee girl will arrive and tell you that she's pregnant. Or your son will arrive and tell you that there's some wee girl pregnant to him. And that may shatter you and shatter your life and shatter everything else. I'll tell you this, dear friend, that there will be times whenever you will reach a low in your life. Some have already maybe been brought to to that point. Some have been led through that point and some can testify maybe to the very fact that at a low ebb, God has been there to help. You see, uh, others will arrive there someday. Job tells us that we will all have days of trouble and triumph and maybe you face that today I was with someone the other day on Wednesday whenever they took their last breath at 69 years of age and goes out into eternity that day will come for us all sooner or later and that's why I trust that above everything else that you're saved as you know that God's able to save you. I had to, I said the other day, in love and in all due respect, whenever I was gathered in Craig Avon Hospital, because I've had contact for a long, long time, and I had to say, well, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be a hypocrite here, so if you ask me to take this funeral, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'll be sensitive, I hope. But the one who has departed this life, as far as I am concerned, never at any time for God. And that's sad. And I can go back 35 years, which is a long time. You know, whenever you reach that point of a low, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they're all going to tell you that God doesn't care, but He does. There's nothing hidden from his view. Maybe today in the Lord's house, your problem is insurmountable, you feel, in your own eyes. But you know, dear friend, it's God's opportunity in disguise. Now the creditor arrives at her home, and to her dismay, he wants to take her two sons as slaves. Now some of you are old enough to know, because I remember it. Back in the 70s, Whenever farmers bought land, and my father was one of them, he bought in a couple of farms of land. And back in the 70s, you would be doing very well even to have paid the interest. The interest rates was over 20%. And some of you will remember that. I do. And I can say as a family, we never went hungry or that, but I certainly, there certainly was nothing to throw round. Because anything my father had, he worked for. And so whenever it came one day to my father, he said to me, he said, 
what am I going to do with this land? And I, I remember saying to him, well, 70 or 80 acres or whatever, if you divide it up, it's not much good to a squad of ones. And I said to my father, I said, as far as I am concerned, those that worked the land are the ones that are entitled to the land. That was my view. I remember my father turning to me and saying, but you've helped out a right wee bit too. I said, no, I didn't. I left home quite early. I I helped out where I could, but I never, ever would have made a farmer, even though I loved animals. I never had made a farmer. I don't think I would. But I'll say this, dear friends, this morning, that here's the creditor, and he arrives. And I tell you, if you're sitting across, maybe things have changed now, from so, some old bank manager telling you, well, look here, you better improve, you better get more money in, or else this, that, or the other thing. It's not a very nice experience. Now, I've paid off cars before. <laughs> and I'll always be glad, mind you, to see the last payment. I'll always be glad to see that. And I'm sure any of us do whenever it comes to paying something off. But here we're told the creditors arrive, and he's going to take our two sons. You see, she has no farm to take. She has no house to take. She has no car to take. So the only thing he can take is her two sons and cause them to become slaves. And so that was an awful dilemma for this poor woman. You see, she didn't know what to do. Her situation was hopeless, but she got her priorities right. And you know, we ought to always teach our children, you don't have to live like the Joneses. You don't have to. We don't have to. We don't have to climb the social ladder. We don't have to have everything that everybody else wants. This woman here, verse 2, tells me that Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? She discovered what was really important. Now, debt counsellors today will advise you on a debt payment plan. And if you're in debt today and you go to a debt counsellor, they will look at your income and your expenditure and you'll make out a big spreadsheet. And maybe you say to yourself, whenever I get my pay, my pay looks so big, but then I lose so much in national insurance contributions, so much in tax, so much maybe with travelling expenses, so much with this, that or the other thing. And you'll say to yourself, you know, maybe I have a glorified wage. It looks big. But this woman here, we're told, that she goes to Elisha. Now, remember that spready sheet? Uh, you'll be asked questions like, what can you do without? Where are you spending money unnecessarily? You see, I wonder sometimes that modern-day debt counsellors get their idea from Elisha. Because Elisha says to her, what have you got? And so that was the starting point. You see, it would have been easy for Elisha to say, Okay, poor widow, you've suffered enough. The Lord will meet your need. Just go home and wait for him, and he'll meet your need. But I want you to notice, dear friend, the Lord involves someone in this. Our Lord feeds the birds, but he doesn't put the food into their mouths. I look back, and you can forgive me for using a personal illustration, we ran into Bible college, 40 years ago next year. And our fees were £1,500. And I have £250. I looked at it that God met my need and that I was able to go back to my old, uh, old job. I was able to work the summer. I was able to work the Christmas holidays. I looked at that was also God's provision to meet my need. And so this woman was going to be involved in the, in, in, in the midst of it all. Don't just sit back and say, but look, my need will be met. I'm sure, I'm convinced today, there's none of us are sitting here this morning like this woman was, who had absolutely nothing, only two sons to feed and a little pot of oil in the house. There's none of us there. But the Lord's going to involve her. Elisha got her to look at her resources. He says, what do you need? And what have you got? By these two questions, this woman was made to see the size of her need and the smallness of her resources. She couldn't possibly meet that need. And so Elisha doesn't say, well, we'll have a collection for you. 
we'll go around the neighbours here and we'll have a bit of a collection, nor I, what would you like me to do? This woman could have got angry with the prophet because she comes to the prophet seeking help and then the prophet turns the whole thing around and he says, but what have you got? Think about it in life. As long as we think we can handle things, why should we ever look to the Lord if we think we can handle it okay ourselves? If we have all the answers, why should we run to him with our questions? And so verse 2, what hast thou in the house? And this was designed to teach the, this widow that it may not have looked like much, but in, rea- or in reality she has already got everything she needed to obtain what she wanted. And she answers and she says, but all I've got in the latter part of verse 2, save a pot of oil. And I understand that that was a flask of oil, wasn't it that? It was what her husband would have used for anointing. It wasn't an awful lot. I, um, that's what it had been used for. And if, uh, um, it has probably sat in the house. It's probably sat in the house unused since her husband died. But that flask of oil was her answer. See, we don't need to pray for God. I don't have to ask God today, and I'm sure most of us don't have to ask God today that God would send us something for our dinner today. I trust that you'll thank him that he's already done that. He's already met that need. You listened to Thought for the Day this morning about the homeless. And I know that we can judge them and we can say, but it's their own fault, that, this, that and the other thing. But they're still human beings and there's still a tremendous need in their lives. And where would we be today if God had never saved us? I'm almost through. I want you to notice the advice that was given. I say this, dear friend, that you have a lot in your house today and in your heart today if you're saved. You have a lot. God has promised to hear our prayers. He has promised to answer our prayers, Matthew 7 tells us. He has promised to meet all our needs. And I'm sure he's already done that. He's already done it. What was the advice that was given? It was to go round her neighbours and borrowers. Do you know what I prepared this earlier in the week? I, I, I just pictured myself or any of us. If you were to wrap your neighbours' doors today and go around and say, I'm looking to borrow some jars. And then you go to the next neighbour, can I borrow yours too and yours too? And you gather them all up. I imagine they'd probably call an ambulance. They say your head's completely away. There's something drastically wrong here. There must be something wrong whenever you're, you're, you're doing this. But she discovered what was really important. She was obeying here. And so she goes around her neighbours and I'm sure they asked, but, but why are you looking at my, my pots? You see, some of us were right in the country and I remember the time if you did run out of sugar or something, you were sent down, we were sent down to Haddon's down the road. And likewise, the Haddon's up to us. And there's nothing thought of it. Now probably most of us are too independent and too proud to knock a, door, a neighbor's door and say, well, look here, uh, you, could I have a loaf of bread or could I have this, that or the other thing? You see, this woman would have to respond and she'd have to say, but I don't understand, she would say, but I know that God is going to make a way here. I need these pots. I need them. You know, as I read this, I thought she was in speaking terms with her neighbours. Bad job today whenever we're not in terms with our neighbours. You know, very often neighbours fall out over boundaries and they fall out over fences and they fall out over hedges and they fall out over all sorts of things. I remember a woman coming to see me one day. I couldn't understand why this woman would want to see me. So I want to ask you a favour here. 
And I had to say, well, I can't do that. I can't use the pulpit as a firing range. She doesn't want you to preach someday in church if you've been a good neighbour because uh, some of my neighbours uh, go to this church and they're not good neighbours. Now I would say they probably were. I would say she probably was the awkward person. I'd imagine that. Maybe that's been judgmental. But you know, this woman here was in speaking terms with her neighbours and so she goes around them. And uh, she borrows, she borrows large ones, small ones, round ones, painted ones, plain ones, square ones, round ones. We could go on and on and on. She borrowed the vessel, she obeyed the Lord, and she and her son shut themselves in the house and trusted God to do what he had promised to do. She found that the possibilities are unlimited whenever you allow God to use what you have got. She shut the door. That phrase is a reference to prayer. Getting alone with God and asking him to, uh, for what we need. Prayer that, w- uh, that must be effective, must be prepared for. We must believe that God is going to answer our prayers and then we shall receive the answer. And there is the miraculous supply. I want you to note that the oil greatly multiplied and all the vessels were filled. When did the oil multiply? It wasn't whenever Elisha told her what to do. It wasn't when the vessels were gathered, nor even whenever she shut the door to pray. No, the oil multiplied whenever she began to pour it into the empty vessels. We sing a wee chorus in Lifeliners sometimes, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. It was when she acted upon faith in the word of God. The only thing that hindered her blessing was the fact that she ran out of empty vessels. And that just illustrates to me that too often we're satisfied with a cup full rather than a bar. Now what, what was she told to do? Because we're told that uh, in verse 6, And it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There's not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt. Many of us as parents, maybe, whenever our youngsters were small, maybe we loaned them a few pounds. And I used to I, keep a book on top of the fridge freezer, and I've said before, Samuel used to say to me, Dad, I'd love to destroy that book. Whenever you get a few pounds, I'd get the book out and I'd mark down the date and whenever something was paid off. But I used to say to them, I'd rather you'd owe me than owe God. You make sure about everything else that you tithe, everything that you've got. Honour God. And God will honour you. But you know, as youngsters go, there are times because it's all about teaching them, isn't it? It's about responsibility and accountability and so on. And then again, maybe the book was set for a while and Maybe they would decide they'd buy something else. <laughs> and then I would joke and I'd say, well, what about the book here? Now, it may seem very hard, but I think the three boys would tell you I'm, I'm a soft eye behind it all. I am. And they got it back indirectly another way. But I'll say this to your friend. This woman here, what she was told to do was pay the death. That was the honourable thing to do. Oh, she could have gone out and she could have said to herself, well, there's plenty more here because I'm going to live with the rest of this and my family the rest of our days. I might as well forget about the creditors now. But that's not what Elisha said. Elisha said, no. You pay the debt and then live you and the house of the rest. Do you think the Bible's practical about these things? It's very practical. Oh, I think of a day whenever a man came to our house many years ago, and again it was about his neighbours and it was about his family, and he stood and he was shouting at the top of his voice, he had fallen out with everybody. And again he thought I had a magic wand or something that I could just sort out all with his neighbours and all the rest of it. 
I understand he used to go to the police instead of coming to me, and then he switched to me to tell me a story. But I had to sit down, but that's not my calling today. That's not my calling. My calling is to preach the word as it is. And I would say, dear friend, that it's an honourable thing to pay our debt. If someone was to come to me, and I'm sure if someone was to come to you, and they owed you money, and they had no intentions of paying it back, and you start to witness to them, tell them they need to get saved in that, I imagine you probably would say to them, would you just hold on a little moment here? I think you'd need to get this sorted out and then start talking to me about the things of God. May God bless his word to our hearts. We're going to sing our closing hymn.